Good morning, everyone. The first thing I would like us to agree on, and I need, um, I need Dr. Tappan's involvement for this. When exactly the 20 minutes starts? <laughs> Dr. Tappan, I need your agreement on when exactly the 20 minutes starts. The 20 minutes starts now, and it's 12.15. So you will go on until 12.35, and lunch is at 12.45 according to the uh, program. We might take a little five minutes more, because there are a lot of hungry people here. All hungry right. people get angry people. 20 minutes. So I'll get those 15 seconds back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good morning again, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to be here this morning. Just to give you a little bit of, in terms of credentials because um, some of the previous presenters you may be quite familiar with. I'm not sure how many people may be familiar with me and what I do. But I am, um, first of all, I am a past student of the college. So I survived seven years. And I think that alone says something, right? The principal, my principal was the XXXX principal, um, Father Dipatai. And he said that I must have been good at school because he does not remember me. <laughs> he said he only remembers the boys who gave trouble. So I'm not quite sure if that's a compliment, but I'm taking it as a compliment. He said he does not remember me. All right. So yeah, so I survived seven years at St. Mary's College. Currently, I'm a counseling psychologist. I have my own practice and my own company. I work mainly with adolescents up to adults and families and so on. Um, I have worked with a number of schools. I'm not seeing any of the people that I have worked with here, but through the course of um, the work that I've done, mainly in workshops and so on, I have managed to mix and mingle with quite a number of principals and staff members, all right? And just to sort of round things off, I have been a, a member of an organization that some of you, I'm sure, would have heard of, the Neil and Massey Trinidad All Stars, for the last 23 years where you learn quite a lot of things other than how to play an instrument. Okay, when we talk about mixing with the urban youth and understanding them and how to motivate them and how to get along, how to break up arguments, how to solve disputes and so on, you learn quite a lot of things there. What's that? I'm not calling any names. I'm not, I will not say Miss Hernandez. I'm not calling any names. <laughs> All right? And I think even closer to home, I am a father of four including two boys. Do not ask me where the boys go to school. Thank you. Good. So, the material I'm gonna present this morning, I have, um, what I've done is that I have done some research in the available literature, and I too have surveyed a number of young men, just as, as Father Dick did, um, in order to get their input, and I've tried to bring all of the information together and to put my own interpretation of it. So that what you're getting is a sort of an amalgamation of many different sources of information. Okay? The topic I've been asked to present on is, is there a pedagogy appropriate to males? A psychological interpretation of male learning patterns. So I think what I'll do first of all is I'll define pedagogy, um, the function or work of a teacher or teaching, or the art or science of teaching. And I would like to focus on the definition, the art, of teaching because when you are dealing with unfamiliar or uncertain territory you have to be very creative okay and you have to look at what's going on around you and you have to be able to shift gears very quickly when you realize that the old tricks are not working so I would like to hold on to the definition of pedagogy as the art of teaching okay and learning patterns involve creating linkages among concepts, ideas, people, elements, and so on. And in terms of psychological interpretation, I'll be looking at how males learn and the ways that attitudes, behavior, belief, and confidence, etc., affect that learning. Okay? So we're all on the same page. How am I going? I'm going all right. Good. So, first of all, who influences male attitudes towards learning? I'll give you a couple of examples. You know them already, but they need to be stated. First of all, there is, everybody has a biological predisposition. Everybody comes into the world with certain, as I'm using the word predispositions, that are already set from birth. 
So that's why you find, for example, some babies are a little quieter, some babies are a little more fidgety and a little more anxious and so on. We all have certain predispositions that are set. And for those of you who are into psychological research, you would always hear the nature versus nurture argument. Well, it really isn't an argument at all. The two are actually very important in the development of any individual. Beyond biological predisposition, the actual persons or groups of people who affect male learning, number one, fathers. And I will keep coming back to the fathers as we go through this little segment here. There is no greater influencer in terms of attitude towards learning than the father. A father, as we know, has a very significant impact upon a young man, a young boy, as he develops into a young man, and the attitude that the father displays in very, very simple ways at times has a, a huge impact on the kind of attitude that the young man will have towards learning. We also have mentors who are older persons that they respect and admire, and I'm choosing my words very carefully because respect and admiration are very, very important in terms of motivating today's young man. Young men don't respect titles anymore. So call yourself teacher or principal, and that means nothing, okay? And also observe behavior of peers. So depending upon what a young man, you'll find my, my, I'll be maybe slanting a bit more towards teenagers and adolescents than primary school children, so forgive me for that, all right? But this is more my focus right now. Um, the observed behavior of peers, whether the other boys are also interested in learning or whether they are interested in you know, several other things. We have the community, the community where the young boys live. What are the prevailing attitudes towards learning there? Are they heckled for coming home in the CIC shirt or in any shirt at all? Are the young boys only interested in things other than improving themselves academically and so on? Those things influence. And of course, um, society, societal values towards learning. Okay? Some challenges, so some challenging aspects of male learning patterns. First thing I call the follow the leader syndrome. Males have a well-known and documented tendency to follow those around them. So if everybody is running that way, we run that way as well. If everybody is challenging authority, we challenge authority as well. If the heroes in the class are the ones who cause the most disruption and the ones who, uh, you know, quote unquote funny and cool because they don't care and they're rebellious and so on, then there's a tendency to follow that as well, okay? And it's important to understand that syndrome. We talk also about the reward system. Boys need to understand and be aware of the connection between learning, academic learning, and success. And in 2013, that connection, I'm not even sure if it's a dotted line anymore. It seems to be, it's a very, very gray area. Somebody had alluded to it earlier, I, mean, I can't remember if it was Gary or somebody, but somebody was talking about the boys not understanding or not making a, you know, wanting a sort of an instant fix. Like, okay, so why should I sit down and study? Why should I pay attention? What's the reward in it for me? Um, you know, if I go out and I sell something, I get money, right? If I go out and I, you know, if I bully somebody or if I show that I am stronger than somebody else, I get immediate respect and people look up to me and follow me and so on. So instant gratification, not understanding the clear link, between, not having a clear link between academic effort and reward is one of the challenges also. It affects the attitudes of males towards learning. Um, of course, we have the rebellious nature of adolescence, the time when young men are transitioning from boys to men and that transition requires that they begin thinking, having their own ideas about things, having developing their own attitude towards the world around them and the way things work. So there's a natural predisposition towards adolescence there. But then guess what? What fuels that? We have a breakdown of systems of authority where young people don't see adults respecting authority anymore. And Dr. Farrell spoke this morning about the BMW breaking the red light and so on. All these other things that seem insignificant, they have a very, very huge impact upon our young people and what messages they get from it, okay? We also have a dearth of role models who are supportive of authority. 
When we look at our parliament, for example, we see what we, I don't need to say what you see going on there, okay? But we see people who are supposed to be operating at a particular moral, let's say, level. And there's a lot of mudslinging and name calling and people interrupting each other and people having to throw people out and all this kind of nonsense. These things have an impact on young people. And at the same time, we have a surplus of role models who challenge traditional authority. So we have all of the, the media stars, the, the, the music and, and videos and um, the movie stars and so on, locally and abroad, eh? because they realize now we have people, hmm, I don't want to go too much into that, right? But we have local stars now who can seemingly get away with anything. Yeah? All right, he didn't come to this school, so I can say it, right? <laughs> All of these examples impact the attitude of young males towards learning. It does not seem like a good deal. Why should I sit down and study? Why should I spend all of this time in a classroom, in a book, learning when the reward, as I said, the reward system clearly is ambiguous and says to me that I can get ahead in other ways. Okay, so these things impact upon male learning. All right, and of course I spoke already about the, um, the fact that um, young males no longer respect authority figures because of their title or position. Right, I too remember the days when I came into here and Father Devatai spoke, that was the principal. Matter of fact, it was so bad in here, when a prefect spoke, you stopped what you were doing. I remember a prefect walking into the class in Form 1 and everybody remained silent and stood up. And that seemed natural. So a prefect had already a level of authority that he could operate from. That doesn't happen now, okay? What happens now is that you have to earn the right to get them to listen to you. And I'll give you some little tricks about doing that, okay? We're in good for time, right. So, um, this section of the morning, this section of the day is really supposed to focus on causes, but the next section deals with solutions. But I think it's, it's kind of appropriate that I have been selected as the last speaker because I am going to sort of segue a little bit into solutions to sort of introduce the afternoon session. So, in terms of what we have learned from what I've been discussing so far and what can be put to use, I have a couple of suggestions which I hope people would discuss and refine further and so on. Young males still have a healthy use for competition. I'll repeat that. Young males still have a very healthy and very active use of competition. When you look at a young boy playing a video game, and what kinds of video games do they play? They usually play what is called first person shooter games. That's the game where you're like you're behind the camera and you have the gun, okay? And some studies on why these games are so popular reveal some very interesting things. Through the course of time, males have always seemingly been fascinated with advancing territory, gaining territory, covering ground, taking some of what is yours and assimilating it into what is mine. And as again, throughout the course of history, this has been a trend, a very, very solid trend among males. And it remains, according to the research, why these first person shooter games are so popular. So if we can probably find some way to tap into that inclination, maybe by the use of smaller groups within the classroom, competing against each other for particular rewards, when certain academic milestones are achieved, it may be something that we can use, not only to generate interest, but to add some variety and flavor to how the classroom is conducted. Because not many people, even adults, and I don't have to commend you all, but then again, it's mostly principals here, right? When I, I've been looking around the room all morning and people seem to be paying attention. And why I'm saying that is significant is because the average person cannot pay attention to voices for very long. 
after a while you get lost, you start thinking about what's missing from the grocery that you need to pick up, what's happening at home, what's going on on TV tonight, what you do, etc. Okay? But people seem to be kind of focused here, so that's pretty good. But you're supposed to, so don't take too much kudos, okay? But standing in front of a group of young men, a group of boys, and simply using your voice, speaking down to them, they're going to get lost very quickly. Okay, so we need to find ways to, to vary it up and so on. Use of technology. Now, I'm, I can't comment because I, this is, I'm not as familiar with the, the current syllabus that has to be taught and how it's designed and developed, but within classrooms, certainly, we need to find more creative ways to utilize technology. Hey, I have five minutes. Right. Good. We need to find more creative ways to use technology. Okay? Um, I don't want to explain too much about that, I'll just leave that, I'll put that point out there and leave that, okay? Now, I had alluded earlier to the fact that boys still tend to follow leaders within the classroom and outside of the classroom. So what if we were able to identify who are the leaders in the classroom, earn their respect, get their air, and use them to influence the others towards more positive behavior? I'm sure that some teachers already do this, and well done, but on a more, probably on a, on a more concerted level, I think it might be a good idea to think about that and to understand the behavioral relations right inside of the classroom. Because there are leaders and there are people who can influence others either to do good or to do badly, okay? Um, and in terms of earning young boys respect, and in terms of getting them to listen to you, they have to feel that you take them seriously, that you are interested in them, and that you take the time to listen to them. Even as far back as my classroom days, I can remember some particularly interesting classes where teachers would just put down the book and we would just talk about stuff. What was happening? What was bothering us? What was affecting us? And a lot of those classes remain with me because it told me this was a teacher who really was interested in me. And not just in getting the syllabus finished or in completing the class or just getting out of the classroom. And when you show a young person, a young male in particular, that you're interested in them and that you take them seriously, you earn their respect. When I do counseling sessions with adolescents, I spend the majority of the time, especially in early sessions, just listening. And whatever they want to talk about, I go along with it. Unfortunately, I have kids at home, so I try to kind of mind their business to keep up with what's happening. So when they speak about different artists and music, I have an idea what they're speaking about, all right? What's that? Yeah, yeah, the modern language and the slangs and so on, you know? Those things are very important because they establish credibility. And you will not believe how far you can go in terms of motivating a young man when you establish credibility with them. Okay? Um, and the last thing which I also found through research, it also mentioned that young males tend to need movement, as in physical movement, more than females do. So if you can find ways to introduce some kind of movement, I'm not, in, I'm not suggesting that you introduce a stampede through the classroom or any such thing, but if you can find ways to introduce movement during class time, you are able to get some of that energy out, and better able to focus on, um, on what you want them to focus on, okay? All right, so I have one more big point that I would like to make, and it doesn't fall directly within what I've been asked to do, but I still need to make it anyway. And it goes back to, I think, where I started. I would just like to make the big point that if there's one silver bullet, and you know what a silver bullet can do? Boys especially, you know, vampire days, the silver bullet kills the, Kills the vampire. Nothing else can, but the silver bullet can. Okay. If there's one potential silver bullet that we can use to address the situation, it is at the fatherhood level. Because we can't control the society, we can't control the community. We may be able to do some control in our classrooms, but we stand a much better chance of supporting fatherhood, supporting good fatherhood, and ensuring that when the children get to school at age 11, a lot of the work has already been done. So I would like to leave that as my big point. That's the last one. And I hope that I have been able to share some, give you some insight and maybe give some ideas for further discussion. Thank you very much. Nobel.